The 3rd century AD was a period of stagnation, crisis, near collapse, and finally recovery for the Roman Empire. From the death of Commodus to the ascension of Diocletian and his tetrarchy, this very eventful century saw the end of the golden age of the empire, a period of anarchy when generals backstabbed each other for control, to the final stabilization of the empire under a competent military elite that managed to avoid its collapse, but also transformed the Roman institution into something akin to a hardline military dictatorship mixed up with a monarchy system. This period is also incredibly rich as far as numismatics go. It was a time of inflation, of massive issuing of coins, and as a result, coins from the 3rd century are affordable for most collectors, very pretty, incredibly diverse in style, and a joy to collect. One comprehensive video about the coins of the 3rd century would be 300 hours long, so today we're instead going on a quick overview of the coinage of the period. Let's get a small taste of what the coins of 3rd century Rome looked like. We will get acquainted with the main time periods of the 3rd century, explain in broad strokes what was going on during each of these time periods, the effects they had on coinage, and finally, we will be looking at two coins per period, one from its beginning and one of its very end, so you can see how coinage evolved as the years went on. Alright, let's get started. If we want to be correct about it, the 3rd century AD is the time period between 201 and 300 AD. But if we want to get a bigger picture of this crisis period, we need to stretch our timeline a little bit. Starting at December 31st, 192, as Emperor Commodus, the last of the Antonine emperors, lies dead on the floor of his private bath. The fall of, the long, of a long-lived dynasty, such as the Antonines, is generally followed by a civil war, and this is exactly what happened. Out of a quick and bloody civil war, a new dynasty rose to power, the Severans, founded by Septimius Severus. This is the first period we will talk about. The Severans ruled between 194 and 235. This was a period of stagnation. Rome was still a powerhouse, coming from the prosperous 2nd century, but cracks started to form in the system that worked so well in the past, and the series of adoptive enlightened despots that were the Antonines was replaced by a family led by a military strongman, much less inclined to listening to senators or, quote-unquote, the civilian advisors. Spoils of war were less numerous, the silver and gold mines were slowly being exhausted, and the size of the army and the state apparatus was increased, leading to a bigger pressure over the private Roman economy and public finances. As a result, economic activity saw a slowdown, and its effects can be seen on coinage. The United struck under the Severans start at around 55-50% silver content. Mind you, Septimius himself inherited the 70% pure coinage issued by Commodus and had to debase it substantially to finance his civil war. By the end of the Severan dynasty, under Alexander Severus in 235 AD, it had around 46% silver. So let's begin by taking a look at a denarius struck at Rome under Septimius Severus. This is a common piece of him, struck around 202 to 210 AD. So when all opposition was already dead and he was firmly under control. Looking at the obverse, we see the bust of the emperor with this very impressive long beard. Despite being a man of the military, it seems like he wanted to pass in his later coins an image of calm and stability. He's shown in the same way as the previous emperors of the 2nd century, wearing the laurel wreath of the pink caps the, and the legends read Severus Pius Augustus. Notice the epithet Pius, which can be translated to something like dutiful, another way of drawing legitimacy to himself as he posed as a servant of the public good instead of the military strongman that he was. The reverse is very benign. We see Felicitas, the incarnation of happiness, she holds a caduceus, the symbol of commerce, and a cornucopia, the horn of abundance. So a display that business could once be could once more be conducted normally, and people could expect prosperous years ahead of them. The legends read Felicitas Augustorum. The word Augustorum is in plural, meaning there were two emperors in charge. Septimius himself and his elder son, the future emperor Caracalla, although at this time 
set team is called All of the Shots. We then go to the end of the Severan dynasty under Alexander Severus. Little Alexander was only 14 years old when he became emperor, and he managed to reign a surprisingly long 13 years with the help of his very ambitious mother and grandmother, as well as a body of senior advisors. Poor Ale Alexander, as cultured and well-intentioned as he might have been, was a pushover and couldn't manage by himself the dangerous world of a highly militarized Roman politics that was set up by Septimius Severus. So, at the end, he just died by the hands of his own troops. This Denarius, struck later in his life, around 231-235 at Rome, shows Alexander as a 25-27 year old man. His earlier coins show him as a young teenager and collecting his pieces is a nice opportunity to see the emperor's portrait looking older and older as the years pass. The fact he reigned for quite a few years means the engravers at the mint had plenty of time to perfect his portrait. The portrait of his coins are surprisingly good in style. I particularly love this coin. The overall level of detail and his young bust capture very well what you can see on his sculptures. The legends around his bust read Imperator Alexander Pius Augustus. Very similar formula to that of Septimius Severus. The reverse likely makes reference to the wars against the German tribes that Alexander had to fight in his later years. We can see Jupiter, the king of the gods and main protector of Rome, in a battle pose, rising his thunderbolt as he is about to throw it on his enemies. On another hand, he holds the eagle, his symbol animal. The legends, Yoi Propugnatori, mean Jupiter the champion, the avenger. With the death of Alexander Severus, we enter a period known as the military anarchy, with the Senate's power being a shadow of what it once was, with the military being made very powerful by the Severans, and with all members of the Severan dynasty dead, this generated a power vacuum that was occupied by the most powerful generals making their bids to the position of emperor. This period was marked by lots of internal violence and lots of short-lived emperors, all of which met very violent ends. The best way to illustrate this is to show a coin of the man who deposed and replaced Alexander Severus, a general called Maximinus Thrax. He was the first of a series of emperors who would rule the empire for a brief period of time before being deposed and killed off by the next general. In Maximinus's case, he reigned for three years, between 235 and 238, basically the time, the time he was able to maintain the support of his troops. This would be the only support of legitimacy for most emperors during this phase. Maximinus himself would have his head on a spike in front of a city he was besieging. On the obverse, we visually have a continuation of the normal for formula for the Denarius. This time, we have the very, this very brutish looking bust of Maximinus. Some say he was a giant and incredibly strong. And the legends around his bust follow the same formula of his predecessor. Imperator Maximinus Pius Augustus. For the reverse, we have a propaganda of his military prowess. We have victory, bringing him a laurel crown, with the simple legends Victoria Augustorum. As the 3rd century progresses, we will see more and more the imagery of these reverses, moving out of the typical propaganda theme that depicted the emperor as a generous man, instead focusing mostly on military success, strength, and manly virtues. For the next three decades, the empire will plunge into a horrible period. General after general will topple the previous emperor and establish his own rule and issue his own coins. The peoples beyond the Roman frontiers will notice Rome's fragility and begin making moves on Roman territories, and economic activity will be greatly affected. This economic downturn, combined with the massive expenditure on the army, as each new emperor tried to strengthen its position by recruiting more and more troops, will result on less and less silver being put on each coin, resulting on rampant inflation and a large deluge of debased coins being made. The last emperor of this period was a man called Gallienus, reigning between 253 and 268. Gallienus was surprisingly competent at his job, but the man had it rough. He saw the empire split in three, with two separatist factions taking chunks of the empire with them, barbarians and the Sasanians ravaging the frontiers, and horrible economic times. 
we can see the hardships he went through by looking at the coins from the beginning of his reign to those of his last years. The early ones still have the appearance of good silver, while the very last ones look like pitiful scraps of copper with a thin silver wash with a mere 5% silver on them. Let's look at one of these late examples. This is an Antoninianus, an inflationary issue worth two denarii from the year 268, minted in the city of Mediolanum, modern-day Milan. This coin is a world of difference from the previous coin of Maximinus. But mind you, it was struck a mere 30 years after that denarius, so we can see the complete destruction of the Roman currency and how bad these decades must have been. For the denarius to deteriorate so much, not only the silver content makes evident how bad inflation was, but the weight too. Being a double denarius, this coin was supposed to weigh around 4.8, 5 grams at least. But by that time, these coins didn't even reach 3 grams most of the time. Despite being so debased, I have to admit though that the portrait in these coins is still somewhat decent. Of course, the die engravers had very little time to make each die, as the mint had to be spewing coins like this by the millions. That's why they're so common today. But still, we have a clearly recognizable bust of Gallienus, even if it looks somewhat plain and simple. With this funny neck beard, some say he had he had it like this to hide some bad skin condition he had when he was young. In any case, very simple bust and very straightforward legends. Gallienus Augustus. On the reverse, we have the seated image of Concordia, the goddess of concord, agreement and fair dealings, something that was sorely missed at that time. Maybe this coin had a bit of wishful thinking in it. Or Gallienus too would meet his end by being backstabbed by some of his higher-up officers. Despite his long reign, Notice that the legends are barely noticeable, as the flan is too small to receive the full design. Probably another measure to save on metal and mint more coins. But we can still make out the Concordia Augustorum there. Rome could have very well collapsed at that time, but miraculously it did not. A series of competent soldier emperors, many from humble origins, from the region known as Illyria, managed to stabilize the situation. I'll call this time period the Illyrian Emperors. This period, from 268 to 284 AD, saw highly competent emperors. These men were good generals and good administrators. Despite the problems of backstabbing and early deaths still being an issue, as many of these men were killed five, six years into their reign, they managed to stitch the empire back together, improve the coinage situation somewhat, and return the empire to a degree of stability. The first of these heroes was Claudius II, also known as Claudius Gothicus, for his major victories against the Goths. Well, hero might be an overstatement. It's quite likely that Claudius had something to do with the assassination of his predecessor Gallienus. But, putting this potentially problematic fact aside, Claudius managed to win important battles, and wasn't for his early death, just two years into his reign, he could have done more for the Empire. As we can see in this sorry excuse of a coin we have here, Claudius inherited an economic system in shambles. His coinage barely has 2% silver in it, and inflation was rampant. This example is from the Mint of Rome, minted between 268 and 270. Clearly these coins were made in a rush, and with very little care to details or quality. The obverse has a pretty generic looking bust. The only clearly distinguishable feature Claudius has in his coins is that very angular jawline on his portrait, and the legends are also very straightforward. Imperator, Caesar, Claudius Augustus. The reverse features virtus, the incarnation of manliness, military prowess, exactly what the Romans were expecting Claudius to deliver. Notice the image of virtus in this quote. The god holds a spear, but also an olive branch, the symbol of peace. Every citizen from the empire was completely exhausted decades of civil war and economic strife, so definitely a reverse fitting for the situation most people were living through. But out of all of the Illyrian emperors, the most successful one was definitely Aurelian. Born in humble circumstances, this man rose through the ranks of the military, very likely by merit alone, different to so many before him who ascended by political favors. He became emperor by acclamation from his troops, defeated at least three different major federation of tribes across the northern borders of the empire, defeated both Gallic and Palmyrene separatist empires, 
unifying the empire once more under one rule, and avoided the collapse of Rome a good two centuries before it eventually did. Definitely a hero. As we can see from this Antoninianus of Aurelian, the coinage saw a remarkable improvement as well. He increased the weight of the Antoninianus to a respectable 4.5 grams, roughly, and increased its purity to 5%. Far cry from what it used to be, but this monetary reform restored some of the trust on coinage and allowed the economy to slowly start recovering. Notice this coin also has a thick silvering layer over it, which helped pass the message this was a better coin, of higher quality, with more silver in it. The silvering in this particular piece developed this marvelous orange tone to it, likely the result of being stored in some recipient that contained iron. This example is from the year 272, from the Mint of Rome, most likely. On the obverse, we have the bust of the emperor wearing his cuirass. Now, that is a very long neck. Realism would never be present on Roman coins from this point onwards, sadly, although it's still a nice-looking piece. Being of such better quality compared to the crappy coins that were in circulation, lots of Aurelian's coins were hoarded away, as we can see in this example. It's pretty much uncirculated, there's no signs of wear whatsoever, but still, these coins are very affordable. Back to the description here, the legends are very straightforward. Aurelianus Augustus, Aurelian the Emperor, simple and straight to the point. On the reverse, we have the god Sol, Sol Invictus. Aurelian was a staunch sun worshipper, building a major temple to this deity in Rome. Being a monotheistic religion, some argued the spread of the cult of the sun god made the eventual transition to Christianity easier during the late empire. In any case, here we see the sun god wearing his typical radiate crown, doing the salutatio gesture, the imperial salute, and he has by his feet a bound captive, symbolizing Aurelian's many victories. The legends read, Oriens Augustorum, something akin to the sunrise of our emperors, a nice connection between the idea of the sunrise and the rise of a new age under Aurelian. The crisis of the 3rd century will finally end with the establishment of the first tetrarchy, the final period of the 3rd century. Emperor Diocletian rose to power in 284 and ruled for 15 years. During that time, he enacted lots of administrative and military reforms aimed at stabilizing the empire, one of which was to establish a joint reign of four co-emperors, two senior Augusti and two junior Caesares. That's why it's called Tetrarchy, the rule of four. Diocletian also enacted the monetary reform, completely reinventing the Roman monetary system. But first, we're going to look at one of his pre-reform Antoniniani, made in similar style, size, and purity as those of Aurelian. This particular coin is from the year 285, struck at the mint of Lugdunum in gold, modern-day Lyon. Stylistically, very similar coin to that of Aurelian. We have the bust of the emperor, this time in a different style, as it was made at a different mint, and the legends this time are a little bit longer. Imperator, Caesar, Caius Valerius Diocletianus Augustus, his full imperial name. On the reverse, we have Felicitas, just like the coin from Septimius Severus from the beginning of the video. Do you remember? Once more, we have the legends, Felicitas Augustorum, so the happiness brought by the emperors, and this time Felicitas is very relaxed, leaning over a little column, holding a caduceus. Diocletian reformed the coinage in 295, creating brand new denominations and a system based on the denarius communis, a unit of account based on the old debased denarius that wasn't struck anymore. I won't get into much detail here today, as the tetrarchy deserves a video of its own, which I will make someday, but let's take a look at Amunus, some, some people call it Aphonis, the successor of the Antoninianus. This would be the main coin used in everyday commerce, big respectable coin of around 10 grams and 30 millimeters in diameter, still of 5% silver content. But since this coin was much, much heavier than the Antoninianus, its fine silver content was much higher, so it was more valuable. This particular coin is from the mint of Treweri on modern-day Germany, struck around 302-303 AD. Notice the very thick silvering on this piece. I always feel like holding a little miracle when these things reach our days millennia later, 
with such a thin silver coating still intact. The Numus typically features the bust of the Emperor wearing a laurel wreath instead of the radiate crown of the Antoniniani. And most of the time, we see the Emperor wearing his military cuirass, like in this example. Quite a big, chunky head that we have here. And it can be quite hard to distinguish one Emperor from the other by style alone. The only way to tell them apart, to be sure, is by looking at the legends. Since we can read Imperator Diocletianus Augustus, we can see that this one was also struck by Diocletian, or at least under Diocletian. The reverse features the Genio Populi Romani, the incarnation of the ingenuity and potential of the entire Roman people. It holds a cornucopia in the typical populist message that the prosperity of the Roman people was within it, and it holds a patera, a ceremonial pot, used on religious ceremonies to make liquid offerings to the gods. Under it, the mint mark, an abbreviation of Secunda Treuri, the second workshop of the Treuri mint. And so, the 3rd century came to an end, and what we call the Late Roman Empire began. As you can see, it was a century of intense transformation of economic, military and political chaos, and eventual restructuring, and definitely an endless source of interesting stories for some 20 HBO series. Hopefully this quick overview of the coinage of the 3rd century gave you a base to your research, if you're a beginner collector, so you know the basics when starting your collection, what you should be looking for. Have you got a coin from 3rd century Rome? Let us know in the comment section down below. I hope you enjoyed this episode, leave a like and consider subscribing if you did, Happy collecting, and I'll see you soon.